Hey podcast listeners, I'm Rick Bennett, host of Gospel Tangents. If you're enjoying the show, I was wondering if you could do me a favor. Please go to iTunes and write a review. It will be important feedback for me, and it will also help us attract more listeners. The more listeners we can get, the more resources we can build. Thanks again for your help, and appreciate you listening. DNA evidence seems to show that Native Americans came from Asia rather than from the Middle East, as the Book of Mormon implies. Dr. Hugo Perego is a population geneticist. How does he explain this? Well, we cannot deny scientifically that there were people here before Lehi, right? Uh, we don't know anything about the Jaredites, really. We think we know, but we don't know anything about the Jaredites. Could have the Jaredites play any role with pre-Lehites? We don't know to what extent. But we know there were people, probably millions of people, okay? So Lehi's family comes. They come from Jerusalem. These people that are here come from Asia. They're closely related genetically to Asian people. Lehi's family comes, 30, 40, 50 people. There are the Mulekites that are coming too. We don't know how many. We don't know uh, if they're a population isolate. We don't know if they mix with locals. Uh, people say, well, the Book of Mormon doesn't say anything about others here, right? So they didn't exist. Well, true, but the Book of Mormon is also a summary. It's not a full record. It's what Mormon decides to put in there, right? And if his focus is to bring people to Christ, he's going to talk about what people were doing to get ready or not ready for that, right? And it's going to leave a lot of the details out. But Nephi, on the small plates, does mention a few interesting things because the small plates are not a summary. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So Nephi, for example, in uh, and people read these things different ways, right? So I'm not saying I'm right. But that's a one way I think is a possible reading. Second Nephi chapter 5, Laman and Lamon wants to kill Nephi. Nephi is in danger. Lehi and Sarai are dead. They're old, they died, they're gone, right? So Nephi says, I need to get out of here. The Lord has commanded me to take whoever wants to follow me and leave. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Second Nephi chapter five. Second Nephi chapter five. And ne Nef Nephi goes to great land on those plates to engrave them, right? To to say name by name who is coming with him. He says you know, I'm taking with me my brother Sam, uh, Zoram and his family, my brother Sam and his family, Jacob and Joseph. He doesn't mention by family, so I don't know if they're too young, they're not married yet at that time. And all my sisters and their families, right? He even mentioned the sisters. So he mentions all of them. That's all the family we know of that could have been there, including Zoram, which is now family because he's married Ishmael, right? And then he says, and all others that wanted to follow me. And you're like, who else is left after all that, right? Who could be these others? Are these like maybe descendants of Laman and Lemuel that want to come with him, you know? But then he would have said, these are Laman and Lemuel, you know, because he went to great land to mention everybody else. So this is first generation. Is that possible that because they have the gospel, they encounter other people, then teach them the gospel, and they become part of their group, you know? You go to Jacob chapter 2. Jacob, first generation in the Book of Mormon land, right? How many people are there right now, right? Of that group, of the original group. How long have they been there? And Jacob in chapter 2 is uh, frustrated with the Nephites for taking too many wives and too many concubines. And you got a group of people like of what? 60, 70, they're all cousins, right? Where do you get these concubines from? You know, where, where are you, how are you satisfying your sexual desires within? And uh, actually, I've been doing some discussion lately with, uh, with some other people around here. And uh, according to Israelite tradition, because they, in the Old Testament, talks about concubines, and Hagar was a concubine of uh, uh, Abraham, mm -hmm. um, the reference to concubine usually, uh, so you, take, you can take wife, multiple wife, according to Jewish tradition, right? Uh, and their wife, as long as they're part of your same culture or your same social status. But concubines are usually foreign women. They do not have the same status within a family. So you treat them as some sort of wife. There is a legal binding 
but they do not have the same status. And um, could it be that the Nephites were doing the same? Some foreign women, some local indigenous women that were... I mean, today with ISIS in the Middle East, a lot of times they're, they're taking these Yazidi women and they're basically sex slaves. I, yeah, I mean, that's kind of... That's another word for concubine. It, it depends culturally where you are. Sex slaves is probably the worst situation you can have. I mean, you're really there uh, only to satisfy uh, sexual pressure. Concubine has uh, some rights as well. Uh, in fact, even today with Islam, you can have up to four wives and as many concubines as you want. But the problem is that the, when your hus the husband die, the inheritance only goes to the first four wives. So as long as the man is alive, the concubines have the same rights of the woman, the same um, lifestyle or status. But then when the husband die, they don't get anything, they, they leave, you know? So uh, wha what I'm saying is that, you know, uh, there is an int it's interesting that Jacob actually talks about concubines. He doesn't talk only about wives. And he's talking about how is a, is a widespread problem. He's not doing a personal interview with one individual. He's, he's addressing, like, uh, it reminds me a little bit um, some of those addresses we, had during, we heard during priesthood session in general conference, you know, where uh, the prophet or some of the leaders like, you know, I really wish I should not, I, I did not have to talk about this, but I have to tell you, right? And boom, comes the, the chastisement, right? And that's how Jacob is doing. It's like, I really wish... You know, uh, he talks about richness, he talks about pride, right? And he says, you know, I, I wish that, was, that would be it, but there is another thing that I need to talk to you, you know? And he's talking to everybody about that, to everybody there. And it's like, you are unrighteous because you want, you're doing this, you're, you're, you're making your wife suffer by justifying, taking more wife and concubines because uh, David and Solomon did that, right? Where do they come from, right? And then you have Jacob chapter 7, and you have Sherem, the first Antichrist, that goes to Jacob and he says, I've been looking for a long time to meet with you. It's like, how, why was he being met? You know, how long does it take to meet somebody that just came with you from, uh, <laughs> from across the ocean? You were on the same ship together, for heaven's sake, right? How long does it take to talk together? And then he says uh, in verse uh, 4, um, Jacob 7, 4, it says, the Sherem was much learned with the, uh, uh, the language of the people. So why would you have to make that reference about him knowing the language if he was part of the same group? Why did he have to learn that language, you know? So you see that in the small place, which is not an abridgment, it, it gives details that apparently are not significant, but there is a hint. It's not maybe the main story is there is a hint that there were others. And the Book of Mormon is a Nephite history. It's not a Lehite history. You never hear about Lamanites' doings unless they come and attack you. You know, they, they're always there doing their own things, and you don't know anything. They're, you don't talk about them. So the Book of Mormon, in general, just talks about a specific family group, a specific reign, and a specific group of people. And uh, it, because it doesn't talk about others, it doesn't mean the others were not there. So does it seem strange, though, that, uh, that a small group would be able to capture such a l l larger group? I mean, at the end of the Book of Mormon, they're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. And that's another thing, you know. Uh, even the biblical accounts and other accounts uh, that uh, are uh, uh, old, uh, they use... N I'm, I'm not an expert in linguistic, and, uh, and you know, I only deal with DNA, but the point is... Uh, uh, I have to kind of look uh, at some of these things and talk with people about those. But it seems to me the numbers are just used as a parable here. They're trying to make exaggerations. Uh, when they talk about millions or hundreds of that, those numbers are too precise, too those, square. Those don't make sense. They don't make sense to me, you know. Uh, they could make sense if culturally the Nephites were able to include a lot of the other people in their beliefs, right? And um, there is an example very early in the Book of Mormon when uh, uh, Mosiah arrived to Zarahemla, and there is another people there which are supposed to be the Mulekites, so the descendants of Mulek, or the people that came with Mulek, and uh, Mosiah becomes their king because he has a knowledge that they don't have, right? Um, so can you have a small group of people arriving and having something than the locals don't have and accept them as the rulers or being able to integrate them. 
because uh, otherwise the population growth is you can't explain that if you really li look at these numbers. If you come to America with nobody here, the population growth doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. So you're saying that it, the, the, the Nephites Either the numbers combined. are exaggerated or the Nephites are and the Lamanites are immediately mingling with, uh, with people here. Okay. Which, uh, so, so enemies of the church or critics of the Book of Mormon will say, well, you're making a lot of things up here. But the reality is everybody is. Uh, we don't have evidence. We are building the, the context of the Book of Mormon based on data that we don't have, based on information. We're making a lot of assumptions. Everybody is uh, against or in favor of the Book of Mormon. We are all making a lot of assumptions. We're, we are saying the words means what we think they means and no other possibility, you know. Or grain must mean this, or steel must, must be what we know steel is, you know. And, um, and, uh, and so that, but we don't know really, and uh, we, there are other explanations. So when it comes to DNA, the big issue is this, right? Um, people say, well, you have Lehi and his family coming from Jerusalem. No one was here. They populated all North, Central, and South America. Then f therefore, the Native Americans living today should have Old World DNA, right? But the reality is, it's all Asian. Right, or it's all it's all Native American, but it, it looks more like Asian than than uh, than the Middle East. Because remember, they came from the Bering Strait, but then they've been separated for over twenty thousand years, and so the DNA of Native American is not identical to that of Asian. There've been twenty thousand years of geographical separation for differences to happen in their DNA. There are random changes over time. That they happen with uh, with your DNA, um, you start seeing markers that have not been seen anywhere else. You know those mutations they happen randomly, and so the but if you look at all the population, the Native Americans resemble Asians more so than any other population. So they're cousins, right? <coughs> they have a common ancestry that is a lot more recent than they have with anybody else, and so because of that, people say the Book of Mormon is is, is not historical; it's a fictional production from the 19th center, century by Joseph Smith. And, uh, and in my mind, is there is one way to read it. That's one way to understand it. But if there were really a lot of people here, and the Lehi group was very small, and there was, as it looks like from this Book of Mormon passages that we talk about it, some sort of uh, admixture, intermingling, you know, and. Uh, um, their DNA would have disappeared within five or six generations. Really? Yeah. So here's something I've... Even your ancestry kit that you bought is guaranteed to help you find relatives only up to five or six generations in the past because after that becomes too diluted. You don't have all your ancestral DNA with you. There the majority of your ancestors are not genetically represented in you. Well, but I've heard that there's uh, that we have Neanderthal DNA in us. Of course. So how how I mean, if if uh, if we're dying out after five years or five generations, how are we how are we able to it's get? It's called the red sampling. We're not testing descendants of Neanderthal. We're testing the red samples. So this is how it works. I talked about that yesterday in my class. It's a very good. Uh, it's a very good example. Okay. It's a very good. Uh, um, what's the word? Assertion. You know, like. Uh, uh, but, but you need to understand how do we know Neanderthal DNA, first of all, okay? So before even DNA testing was available, Neanderthals were identified, okay? When, when, when were Neanderthals identified first? It wasn't in the last 10 years. No. We, know, we know about them for a long time. And that's because in the valleys of Neanderthal in Europe, in North Europe, um, they found these skeletons. I mean, almost complete skeletons. And so anatomically, that is the first analysis, anatomically, they were able to see that they had features different than Homo sapiens, okay? Their, their schools are different, their, uh, their build is different, okay? So they say, this guy looks like humans, but they are not us, okay? And they call them Neanderthal because of the place where they found them. And they kept them in museums for all these years, right? And only a few years ago, like maybe five years ago, I mean, I was uh, doing my PhD and I did uh, um, one of my um, exams was uh, one, um, 
uh, score exams, like my uh, research that I had to present to the committee was on Neanderthal DNA. And um, it's only been, uh, and when I did it, they didn't even have a full sequence of Neanderthal yet, okay? It's very recent, I think it's 2013 um, that the first sequence was done, complete sequence, uh, in Germany. Uh, they did that. And uh, now, because we know the anatomy of the Neanderthal, we take the Neanderthal bones and we run a complete sequence of DNA from those bones. So now we have a Neanderthal reference, all right? How do we know that that's Neanderthal? How do we know that that's Neanderthal because DNA? Because we found the bones? Because we have the skeletons. We first classify the skeletons, then we got the DNA from that. And then we compare the DNA of Neanderthal with the Homo sapiens, uh, which is us, and I'll just hit my microphone, open the dog, and which is us, and we saw differences in between them. We actually find out that uh, the average Euro European carry about two to three percent of Neanderthal DNA still today in some of the most conservative area, more conservative areas of our genome. Okay, it's not the other way around. There is no Homo sapiens DNA found on Neanderthal samples, but we found Neanderthal DNA on Homo sapiens. So you have probably between 1 to 2, 3 percent of Neanderthal DNA in you. Uh, it's that's so today. It could change 5 or 10 years from now, you know, but the current research think that there was some uh, crossbreeding between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, which caused you to have some of their DNA. And the reason why we have their DNA and they don't is because they were a, um, a hosting population in Europe. They've been in Europe a lot longer than we have. Their genes have been, uh, were better fit and, uh, and to some degree you can say dominant, but that's not the right word, but they, uh, they, they had better fit genes than we had as we were the incoming population, you know. So they went through all the process of natural selection, which we still need to go through. And so when that happens, when you have a population that is more established than another, the new population, then the gene flow goes from the stronger population, stronger as not in uh, physically strong, but genetically uh, stronger. stronger or fit for the environment, to the one that is uh, just becoming a quantum, which is one thing you need also to consider with Book of Mormon migrants' DNA. They are living, their genes are fit for the Middle East, not for America. If there is an Austin population that has been there for 15,000 years and you just arrive and you get from each parent, you get a copy uh, of genes, right? But only one gets passed to the next generation. The more fit are the ones that eventually are found. And so it makes sense to me that the, the Book of Mormon DNA, um, the genes of the Book of Mormon people would have not had a a competitive chance with local genes to be passed Even on though they were around for a thousand years? I mean, a thousand years seems like you should be able to s still have that around. I, if you are mixing with local population, their genes will have a, a better... Well, let me ask another question. So there's... Uh, the Do you understand the question about Neanderthals now? You know, we know what they're... So I can find, I can find a little tiny piece of bone today in a cave and not know what that belongs to because anatomically it's too small to, to know which species belong to. But because now I have the reference of the DNA, I can test the DNA on the little piece of bone and I can tell you if it's Neanderthal, modern human, um, uh, the Denisovan, you know, all these other uh, archaic uh, uh, hominids. With Lehi, we cannot do that because okay. we don't have his body. I hope you enjoyed our discussion with Dr. Ugo Perego. We're not done with talking about the Book of Mormon and DNA just yet. It turns out a black African tribe, unlike Native Americans, has Middle Eastern DNA. Are there limits to DNA technology that allow us to f find out certain things about populations? Do you think we can determine DNA from uh, 1800 versus DNA from 1000 AD from Europe found in America? I would think so. And the answer is not. Click here to subscribe, click here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some other videos that we've done here on YouTube. We hope you'll use this as a valuable resource to learn more about Mormon history.